I remember when I first joined the company in the 80s, Bob Denard who was the special guy. He had invented so much of the technology, and he was the de facto leader in semiconductors at the time in IBM. The wonderful thing about Bob Denard's life is that it's a story of America's transition literally from an agrarian society to a modern microelectronic powerhouse. Denard uh, grew up in rural Texas. He grew up for a while on a farm without electricity in the early 1930s. He was educated in a one-room schoolhouse. He came to Carnegie Mellon to get a PhD in electrical engineering and showed up at IBM right at the time when the microelectronics industry was coming into existence. I remember the first time I came here, I was just stunned by the building. I said, get to you get to work in a place like this. The building itself inspires you. Was this Bob's office the entire time you were at Yorktown? Yes, yes. So that's Bob's office that we did many of our uh, discussions, heated arguments and all that. And you can see his blackboard, which is kind of famous, and he still uses it. Denard's first contribution was in 1966 when he invented a memory device called a dynamic random access memory, the single cell transistor. And what was important about the DRAM is it became the fundamental building block for this industry, which literally transformed the entire world. It just, it would be impossible to create a lot of the products that we've created through all these years, the games, the cell phones, I mean, it just wouldn't be possible. It's just a one transistor, one capacitor. Yeah, it's so, so simple. It's a piece of uh, very uh, beautiful physics. I think the simplicity which was clear in Bob's mind was not clear in anybody else's mind. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> We've had a term in IBM for decades, which is wild ducks. So this was a, an ad from the mid 1960s of wild ducks and you can see Everybody's flying in that direction except one duck going that way. Doesn't fly in formation. And that's that's a classic. If this was our researchers in the 60s, that would be Bob Denard going in the other direction. So after Denard uh, invented the, the single cell transistor, he made a second significant contribution, which in a sense is even more important. In 1972 and then again in 1974, he outlined what he called the scaling theory. With each generation of technology, these devices got smaller, they required less power, and the computers got more powerful. And that process led through uh, something that's referred to as the golden era of scaling. So Moore's Law seems like a straight line uh, on a semi-log, but it wasn't when you look under the covers. Every introduction of a new lithography tool was another sort of speed bump where we had to reinvent masks, photoresist, the, the, the whole deal. And then fast forward, Throughout this, Bob taught us back in the scaling laws that you had to keep dropping the voltage or else the power density would get too much to deal with. I remember thinking, we'll never break the one micron barrier. <laughs> and here we are at five nanometers. Bob is very nurturing and tough at the same time. Literally at the same time, the two sentences that follow each other, one is, you basically don't understand anything. Go back to high school. And second thing is, together we can change the world. And, I mean, just gotta love a guy like that. It's really quite remarkable because once upon a time, at the beginning of the microelectronics era, technology would trickle down from mostly military applications toward the consumer world. But with the falling cost of computing that was enabled by Denard scaling, Technology now comes from the bottom up. In my time alone, we've gone from a single transistor to tens of millions of transistors on microprocessor chips. On memory chips, we've gone from 16 bits to 64 million bits. Bob and I would always, would discuss, was there gonna be an end to this, and to the scaling? And he says, yes, there's an end to scaling, but there's no end to creativity. Five years from now, we're going to be building a better semiconductor device than we're building today. It's our job to figure out what that better device is. He was intensely curious. He was a problem solver. And those two qualities are what make the best researchers, not just at IBM, but throughout the entire computing industry. He is seen as the archetype for the best and the brightest of the world's engineers. 
What, what I want to tell you all is that if you want to be successful, attitude is everything. We have all the knowledge you need, and you ought to be ready to have the attitude to do something with it.